Hello everyone, my name is Chris Black. I work in the communications department here at WHO headquarters in Geneva. And we're coming to, to you live today from our headquarters in the beautiful executive boardroom. And we've got a fantastic show for you today. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm joined by two of our leaders on health data and science. We've got Dr. Samira Asma, who is the Assistant Director General for Data Analytics and Delivery for Impact. Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, our WHO's Chief Scientist. So thank you so much for joining us today. And recently WHO held its first ever Data Governance Summit. It finished last week. And so we're going to be talking about data and data governance today. Uh, Dr. Samira, could you tell us why data governance and data sharing is so important? Yes, Chris, uh, data is the lifeblood of public health. And we need timely, reliable, and actionable data so that we can address to the real-time issues and challenges in a very strong way. WHO convened its first data governance summit to define the rules of the road to make sure that the data that is collected is shared openly, but also at the same time, it is governed by good practices and principles so that we at the same time protect the privacy of the citizens as well. Excellent. Thank you so much, Doctor. Could you tell us a little bit about um, how it works and how, or how it should work? What is, what, what is our hope for da good data governance? For the data governance, we need networks, we need collaborations, we need data principles. Uh, we need to be a trusting partner so that the data that is being gathered, the data that is being stored, the data that is being analyzed, and the data that is being shared is done in a systematic way that benefits the lives and health of people everywhere and it benefits the partners as well and governments in particular uh, so that good policies can be put into place. We need to have mechanisms for capturing data and storing data and sharing data in a, in a, way, in a manner that is secure but also that is easily accessible in a way that people can understand Thank you so much. Um, our first ever summit on this subject, why now? And what kind of uh, partners were involved in this meeting who joined? The timing was very important for WHO to convene the first Global Data Governance Summit. It is very important because we are in the midst of a pandemic and there is a huge astronomical amount of data that is being gathered. But we also face the lack of data, the lack of timely data. And we needed to bring all the stakeholders together, experts, partners, governments, collaborators, to understand what are the underlying principles that we should operate with so that data is available as an open public good, but at the same time we have checks and balances so that we can protect the privacy of the citizens. Thank you. For those who are just joining us, this is the WHO face, uh, Social Media Live. We're coming to you on all our social media channels. If you're watching on Twitter and you would like to ask us a question, please use hashtag AskWHO. If you're on Facebook or LinkedIn, put a comment in the, in the comment box that's underneath the video there. Tell us where you're watching from and if you have any questions on health data for our experts here today. Dr. Swami Nathan. Data, in terms of your work as chief scientist, must be one of the most important things. Like ice cream, it comes in many, many flavors. If you can tell us a little bit about what kind of data WHO works with and what, um, what, how, do, is, how, do, how does that impact our work? And I'll do that maybe with some examples. And I want to build on what uh, Samira said about uh, without data, they really, you can't uh, progress in achieving the health goals. Because let's take a country that really doesn't know how many um, TB patients are there or how many people have diabetes in that country or what people are dying of in that country. Uh, how is the health ministry or other ministries, how are they going to take action you know, to prevent uh, or manage those, those conditions and prepare uh, for those? And I think country after country, 
we're finding out that when you get, collect good data, it basically shines a spotlight on an area of darkness. And then once you have the light on that, then you can take action. So uh, there are different kinds of data. So there's the public health data that ministries of health collect, which they routinely you know, provide to WHO. But here again, there are gaps. We find many data sets are not broken down or disaggregated by age and sex. And that's the very basic that you would need. Even our COVID data, half the countries are not breaking it down by age and sex. Um, then you have data from individual patients. And here again, there's a, a good success, I think, with the COVID clinical data platform that WHO set up very early on in 2020. And today we have, I think, 350,000 patient data that have been submitted onto this platform. So what this does is it gives you this huge amount of uh, data to work with and to make analysis and make, make some good conclusions from. So you can see the difference between working with 100 patients. Let's say it's a small country and they have few cases. But if they submit it to this large global data platform, then it becomes part of a very large data set. And the more heterogeneous and the broader the data set, the better the conclusions can be drawn from that data. And you can now start asking questions about what's important for COVID prognosis. Is it age? Is it sex? Is it underlying comorbidities? Is it the way you get treated? Does it depend on which country you live in? So these questions can only be answered if you have those kind of large data sets. So I think the, the COVID data platform is a good example of how WHO has been able to gather data. Uh, and of course, it's important going back to the principles that Samira was referring to, that we need a transparency in how this data is handled, who has access to it, who's going to be responsible for analyzing, who will get credit when there are scientific publications. The same thing applies also to research uh, data, and this is something the science division is working on, because Again, take COVID, there's been so much research, but also take other diseases. Let's take um, tuberculosis, for example. There are multiple trials going on in the world uh, trying to look for MDR-TB, the multi-drug resistant TB treatments. It's a, it's a very dangerous disease. It's a killer disease, um, but there are small studies. If you could put those together and have a larger data set, you could again start looking at, okay, so what are the factors that make it easier for people who have drug resistant TB to get cured and get better. And that can then inform our policy guidance. And as you know, WHO tries to rely on the best possible evidence when we make our uh, guidelines. And one way of doing better guidelines is to have better data, better evidence, bring together the research. And I'll end with another example from COVID. So many great uh, learnings from COVID, Chris. I think we should apply to other diseases. So what we did is we realized there were all these trials going on around the world. So we contacted the, the principal investigators, the people who are leading those trials to say, hey, would you mind agreeing to pool all your data together? This is unusual. Usually in investigators do the study, they take their time, they analyze, they publish, they get one publication in a journal. That's the reward for a researcher. In this case, we said the reward is bigger. It's to inform global guidelines. And they all agreed. Everyone agreed, including the private companies that were developing some drugs, provide the data to WHO. We do the, what we call a prospective meta-analysis, in, which informs the treatment guidelines. As you know, we just came out with the IL-6 guidelines, the, the corticosteroid guidelines. They use the same approach. Uh, everyone gets credit, but they do it in a collaborative manner, agreeing in principle to share beforehand. And the rules are all laid out beforehand, so everybody knows what to expect. So I think these are good practices which we need to make part of our, yeah. Thinking about COVID, um, we've seen COVID shone a light on many inequalities around the world yes. in terms of vaccines, in terms of access to information, in terms of many things. Would you say that we do have, a, uh, like vaccines, a two-track pandemic? Would we have a two-track pandemic for, for data as well? We do. And, you know, Samira can talk about the completeness of the um, civil registration vital statistics data. In the developed world, Every birth and every death is recorded, and every death has what we describe as a cause of death. So when you look at your official database, you can actually know how many people died of COVID versus other things. You can estimate excess mortality, etc. But in many parts of the world, I mean, just look at Africa. I was uh, on a panel today with um, Dr. Shabir Mahdi from South Africa, 
and he was uh, showing some very stark statistics about the COVID cases and deaths reported from Africa being so low and yet South Africa because they have a better system for birth and death registration relatively high compared to the population high cases high deaths and that's probably not because South Africa has more deaths than any other country on Africa but it's because the data is being collected and, and there is a data platform that everyone can see the data so I think the lack of data uh, especially on mortality has been, um, uh, been uh, highlighted and WHO estimates I think that there are at least two to three times more deaths that have occurred due to COVID than have been reported to WHO and it's important for countries to know because you can't plan if you don't know what's going on in your, in your country. Indeed. Let's talk a little bit about the barriers, Dr. Asma. Um, what are the barriers against good data and what do we need to see change to, make, to reduce those barriers? Absolutely. Barriers are many, as uh, Somia mentioned. Uh, looking at just the COVID deaths, we are relying on guesstimates. We need actual data on deaths. Death is a fact of life. And because of the variability and the capacity in countries, countries are unable to report deaths to WHO. Last year, when uh, we analyzed the data for deaths that have been reported to WHO, those were 1.8 million deaths for 2020. And when we looked at the excess death analysis, we reported 3 million deaths only for 2020. That is about 1.2 million death excess. And we are beginning to continue to analyze for this year and go through a country consultation process. But again, as Somia mentioned, we also did an assessment where we looked at where the countries are with regard to their data and health information systems. This is the first ever assessment that has been undertaken in about over 180 countries representing almost all of the world's population. And what we found is this is the score for health data technical package. And we look at S-C-O-R-E, and it's a technical package of essential interventions around data and health information systems such as surveys, CRVS, optimizing routine health information systems, reviewing the policies with regard to data, and finally, using data to enable uh, policy impact in countries. So the challenges were really diagnosed from this assessment. What we found were that only 27% of countries had the capacity to survey public health threats. And when we look at death data, such as civil registration and vital statistics, four in 10 deaths are registered globally. And this becomes more acute when we look at the African region, where now out of 10 deaths are not registered. So when deaths are not registered, it's very, very difficult to know uh, how many people have died and let alone knowing what they died of. And it becomes very difficult for governments to channel resources and to allocate those resources appropriately. We have seen that even in the most developed countries where data is available, there has been data fragmentation and the communication amongst the partners has not been optimum. That's why WHO organized this data governance summit so that we bring all partners together. But when we look at many of the least developed countries, data gaps are very prominent and the capacity is not there in terms of routinely collecting information through surveys, through routine sensors, through capturing births, deaths, causes of deaths, tracking diseases, tracking routine health systems so we know the supplies, where the health facilities are. When we think of data, we think of it as, as an abstract. Maybe it's a number or it's a spreadsheet, but it is not because there is a person behind every number. There's a human life behind every number. It deals with births, it deals with illnesses, it deals with deaths. And we need to know this life cycle so that we can ensure that we use data 
so that everyone everywhere lives a healthier and fulfilling lives. And it is possible because we have the solutions to address the data gaps. And we should do it very soon because we have a very short window of opportunity that COVID has demonstrated. Thank you so much, Dr. Asma. And thank you, everyone, who's been sending in questions. My phone's on fire here with questions, and I've been a little bit greedy asking all my own here. So let's get down to some questions from our viewers. And just a reminder, if you're watching on Twitter, it's hashtag AskWHO. LinkedIn and Facebook, it's in the comments field. So send us your questions, what's on your mind today. And we're going to start with a question from Periscope, actually. Carmel Keeley asks, and this builds on what you were saying, Dr. Asma, how does WHO access data concretely? Where do we get our data from? We get data from the member states. We are a member, WHO is a member state driven organization. And as part of WHO's constitution, member states, countries submit data to WHO, submit data during emergencies as well as submit data r routinely on people who have died, causes of death by age, by gender. And currently, there has been not a standard way for countries to submit data. Now we have technology at our disposal. So what WHO is doing is designing and developing a World Health Data Hub using technology and a secure channel for countries to deposit data to WHO. And we have already used that and it is working well. But we also need to understand that we also need to build the capacity in the countries so the data at the country level is captured so that it can be submitted to WHO. And this hub is going to, does it go both ways? Is it how, also how we're Absolutely, going to it goes both ways. So the World Health Data Hub has three segments. One is a direct channel, a two-way channel between country and WHO so that we can have country consultations, we can strengthen capacity in analytics and understanding data. So it is a real-time mechanism that is being put into place. We need that. The second is how we capture data, how we bring all data together, because data is really fragmented. We need every program, every topical area, whether it is TB or tobacco or alcohol, uh, or any other infectious disease such as malaria. We need all of this data together so that we can really design solutions. So that is a database that can be accessible at various levels of access to public and partners. And finally, how we make insights, how we gather intelligence using all the different sources of data and share it in a simple, easy to understand way to, for the public, for the policy makers, for the partners. So this all comprises Data Hub and we are very excited that it will be made available very soon. Thank you, Dr. Asma. Dr. Swami Nathan, um, you t we talked about all the different types of data. Uh, we have a question from a viewer, uh, Alaze Marie Vin, and talking about if, how do we know if data is accurate or has been manipulated? So in a way we've got, I'm assuming we have good data, we've got less good data. So when, when we're working with data, how do we know if it's good or not? That's a really good question, actually. <laughs> and um, it's, it's a very important question, because I think we know that if you are going to work with uh, substandard data or, or even worse, falsified data, uh, then you're not going to get the results that, uh, that you hope for. So this is why there are a number of data checks that are done. And usually in a data collection system, or if it's a survey questionnaire or something, the way it's designed is usually to cross check on a couple of things. So you don't ask the question only once, you ask it a couple of times in different ways. And that's a sort of internal consistency check. Um, so if you get something odd, and nowadays, you know, artificial intelligence algorithms are being also deployed to, to check the consistency of the, of the data. Sometimes you can also use your common sense when you look at data, uh, things which are not, which cannot be explained uh, or which seem to, to either too good to be true or things which do not fit with other facts that you know, then that starts raising red flags for you. 
and this applies I think to routine data as well as to research data when you submit your research findings to a journal you know it's peer reviewed by a number of people who are experts in the field and they when they look at your data should be able to in most cases tell if there is something that's uh, not looking right and then of course there's a back and forth there are questions that are asked you have to and in this in, in the spirit of transparency uh, we expect all researchers to be willing to submit their original data sets so and if you're willing to do that that means you're not trying to hide anything and uh, you know that people can actually see that but I think this is really important uh, to keep in mind that not all data sets are the same and that there are very poor quality data sets which are better not used rather than uh, make any conclusions from them. People are going to think I'm a little obsessed with ice cream, but I'm going to ask another <laughs> ice cream analogy. Uh, a little bit of ice cream is a good thing. Too much is, is probably not good for you. Can you have too much data? Can too much data distract you from making good decisions? Or is the more the better? I don't know uh, about too much data because uh, right now we're in a situation where there isn't enough data or if there is it's either of poor quality or it's not being shared so I think it's not just enough to collect data I think many countries also do that you know they collect lots of data at the most uh, peripheral level so you have health workers who are given you know pages and pages of forms to fill up but then by the time it, it's uh, transferred up uh, a lot of it is I think uh, lost in the process or not used properly so I think it's important not to overburden and overload people. So perhaps in that sense, yes, we don't want to collect irrelevant and unnecessary data. We can uh, work more efficiently. So we don't want to do 10 surveys if one survey is sufficient. And we, uh, one of the things I think that WHO is trying to do here is also be more efficient about doing surveys. We don't want every department doing a survey at the same time and burdening countries. How can we do this more efficiently? But I think, uh, so perhaps if duplication would be it's a, duplication and other things should be avoided but I, I would say at this point in time we're not in a situation where we're saying hey we have too much data yeah. and we have to slow down okay so we yeah. can have some more ice cream <laughs> um, question it was um, ethics surrounding data collection and personal privacy something that was considered at this global data summit Dr. Asma absolutely uh, WHO has data principles where we outline that data is a public good. Um, data belongs to the country. Uh, we need to ensure that the ethics and the personal privacy and the consent is taken when the data is collected from an individual. But also we need to have an audit trail as to how the data is being uh, processed um, and, and guard that data, WHO steward uh, of public data so we need to make sure that we are following those principles and policies and uh, standard operating procedures um, so all all those aspects are important but also cyber security is an important area that we want to make sure the IT infrastructure is strong enough um, so that we uh, protect the data from getting into our hands, which are data that is sensitive. But we also have technology to remove the pers personal identifiers and make data available as a open, open public good. Uh, I want to come back to your question about how much data is good or quality data. What we are struggling today is while we may have or we do have sometimes a lot of data, but it is important the question that we want to answer when we collect data. Are we answering the right question so that we can address it with the right policies and right programs? That is important. And we also need to make sure the data collected is comprehensive in a way so that it can be disaggregated by gender, by sex, by socioeconomic status, so that we address those that are also vulnerable. Uh, we want to bridge the health inequalities. We want to close the inequality gap. And for that, we need to know who's being left behind. And we wouldn't know if we don't have good data systems in place. And as Dr. Tedros has said, we cannot make progress if we cannot measure progress. So that is very important. Thank you. So if I can add, yeah, Dr. Because, uh, you talked about ethics. Mm -hmm. Just last week, we released the um, 
uh, a report or a framework on the ethics and governance of artificial intelligence in health. And that addresses, because artificial intelligence uh, to be effective basically depends on good data sets. Mm -hmm. And so the principles and the ethics around how you collect that data and use it, and, and how do you make artificial intelligence um, equitable, non-discriminatory, all those uh, issues are addressed and there are checklists provided for, uh, de for the developers of artificial intelligence, so for the private sector, for individuals, ordinary people and citizens and countries who will be sharing their data mm -hmm. and for the uh, public sector, the ministries, on, on what kind of rules they should uh, develop in their own countries to govern artificial intelligence. But this, you know, we see this in the future, not just in diagnostics, but also in treatment and, and also in drug discovery. So this is an important area for us for the future. And just as important must be how the systems are set up in the first place to make exactly. sure that they're set up without yeah. bias. Um, if we're looking at systems, um, and we know how much technology has perhaps brought a positive light, a positive aspect to data collection. Um, how important is strong primary health care, boots on the ground, what data collection, as opposed to low tech data options as well as high tech? Is that just as important these days? Or is it all high tech? No, no, I think you can't have high tech without the low tech. And we've seen that again in COVID, that when countries try to rely only on technology, it doesn't work. You need the human element, because ultimately you're dealing with human beings when it comes to health. So there are individuals there, there are families and communities, but there are also the healthcare workers, and they are the interface. So they are the ones who are going to collect data. And so I think whatever is generated by them is what is critical, and we need to improve the quality and empower them to be able to collect and, and, and transmit that data. And that's where the digital tools come in. So instead of painfully filling out paper registers, they can now use tablets with drop-down menus, which can save them a lot of time. But essentially, it has to be a human being, a trained human being who does that. That's great. Is that something that was considered in the summit, uh, Dr. Asma? There's local, the importance of local, the local it is capacity? It's extremely important. We cannot say that technology is the panacea of, of uh, we need human capacity, we need trained epidemiologists, we need trained community healthcare workers, uh, we need um, uh, good systems that are providing uh, tools and solutions in every country so that we have a workforce that is not only capturing data but also analyzing data and w as well as using data to deliver impact in the lives of people that we serve. So anal analytical capacity becomes very important. So training the WHO Academy is going to be an important means to provide online training for a number of people at a given time. And academic institutions play a very important role and as well as in the governments, training on, jo on job training. Uh, is extremely important. We have something called field epidemiology training program in a number of countries where uh, uh, folks get training on the ground, which is the boots on the ground. So these are the graduates who have successfully uh, prevented Ebola from flaring up in Nigeria, for example. Uh, so the training and the human capacity is extremely important and that's where we need to put our focus on as well. Thank you so much. And just a reminder, we're talking about health data today with experts from WHO. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you have a question on Twitter, it's Ask WHO. Just tag us, hashtag Ask WHO. And in Facebook and LinkedIn, uh, put the questions in the comments. We're running out of time a little bit though, so I'm summarizing a few questions because so many are coming in. On people's minds, a lot of our viewers' minds, is vaccination in terms of COVID. So how does WHO working on COVID vaccination data generally? Are we tracking these things? Are we tracking adverse effects? Uh, what's, what are we looking at? We're tracking all of those things. So with our partners, that is UNICEF and Gavi and PAHO, we are tracking supplies um, through COVAX, through the COVAX facility. But we are also tracking vaccine coverage in countries uh, through a number of different uh, data sources, both what countries are reporting to us directly, but there are uh, other data sources. And so on our website, actually, we have a dashboard 
that we are monitoring uh, COVID cases and deaths, but then we are also monitoring vaccine coverage. So you can look at that by country, by region, etc. It's very important also to be tracking um, the clinical trials. So we have a clinical trials tracker, and as of now, we have 104 vaccine candidates in clinical development. Uh, and about, of course, we know that there are already 17 or 18 vaccines in use. Um, but we still have a huge number in development. We're tracking the R&D uh, around vaccines. We're tracking adverse events through the pharmacovigilance system in countries. And, you know, we have a committee that looks at this uh, database frequently and uh, tries to pick up if there are any serious adverse events being reported. Uh, but again, the systems are a bit weak, particularly in the low middle income countries. And so most of the adverse event reporting, you know, that has come so far has come from the high income countries. So again, this is a, a, a systemic weakness that we need to uh, correct going forward. We're also working actively with countries through our regional offices and our country offices to set up studies on vaccine effectiveness. You know, as you know, people have a lot of questions now, is this vaccine better than the other one? Is it working against the new variants? So this can only come from real world effectiveness studies and they need to be well designed and, and well conducted. And then when they're, again, when they're pooled, then they add to the global database and then we can change our recommendations based on uh, good quality data. But what we don't want is, uh, is to be making guidelines on anecdotal data. So this is why we need really good systematic data collection and we need it from all parts of the world. Thank you. Dr. Asma, uh, we've got a good question here from uh, one of our viewers, Nazarius, talking about how important data is and building on something you said, um, how important it is to to humanize the data in a way, that every data is a different person with different needs. Uh, could you talk to us a little bit more about that? Yes, very good question, Lazarus. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, data is not an abstract. Uh, there is a face, there is a person, there is a family member behind every statistics, every data. And we need to tell stories about data. Uh, I, I can just say one that really uh, I can't get to forget uh, is a BBC newspaper headline and a picture of seven stillbirth babies wrapped in a, clean, a green cloth. Uh, these were stillbirths that happened because the healthcare workers were not available because of COVID in a hospital. And there were, in one given day, seven stillbirths. So we really need to understand uh, that the, these are lives that we are losing uh, because of the pandemic, but also we need to account for these. Uh, so the stories make an impact and it will help us bring the focus and priority to the topic. Um, so I agree with you that uh, telling stories uh, is going to be extremely important and is very important. Thank you so much. Um, speaking of data, we're going to go through a list of countries of people who have been watching us uh, today. Uh, we've got viewers from Turkey, Zambia, Angola, UAE, Indonesia, Mexico, India, Morocco, Pakistan, Nepal, Algeria, Sweden, Jamaica, Mongolia, Kenya, Nigeria, Philippines, South Africa, Botswana, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Namibia, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Fiji, Canada, Malawi, and from LinkedIn as well, Indonesia, Spain, Mali, Ireland, wow. Gabon, Australia, Canada, what else have we not? Maldives, Brazil, Ghana, Rwanda, Cuba, Switzerland, Guinea, Italy, and Portugal. That is just fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today. We've unfortunately running out of time. We still have lots of questions. Where can people get more information, Dr. Asma, if they're looking for this? I know we've got some some innovative ways that we're showing data on WHO's website. Maybe you can tell people about that. So about. I would say visit who.int forward slash data and just keep scrolling down. You will find data on uh, COVID and then you will have see the data stories, data visualizations, ways to collect data, the data governance and the data sharing policies uh, and the principles and you can contact us. And I also want to say that WHO can do this all alone. And this is a representation of the work of all the countries, all the participants who have joined us today, as well as many partners who are providing the resources to WHO.
Your last thoughts, Dr. Swaminathan. This last 18 months has been a wild ride for everyone and the world has changed. 18 months from now, where, where would you like to be when it comes to data? I would like to be in a place where we see more data, collaborate, more collaboration between um, people across the world, between countries, between researchers and academics and those who have access to the data and really coming together to answer some of the tough questions that face the world as a whole. You know, apart from COVID, there are many, many large public health issues that we have to fight jointly, you know, whether it's tobacco use or other non-communicable diseases, whether it's mental health, whether it's antimicrobial resistance or diseases like malaria and TB, which unfortunately are increasing uh, because of the disruptions in the pandemic. We do need to come together to and, and one of the first things we can do is to pool our data, work together to understand what the real issues are, what the questions are that need to be answered. And then once you have those uh, better knowledge and identify the knowledge gaps, then that's when you start finding solutions. So that's what I'd like to see. I think COVID has shown us the way on how we can collaborate. And uh, once we have a, a goal and a mission, uh, we've made a vaccine in 11 months that would not have been possible if it were not for global collaboration, including the private sector. So this is where I think we all need to come together to solve the big public health issues. Inspiring words. Thank you, Dr. Asma. Same question for you. Mm -hmm. By the time we have our second Health Data Governance Summit, what is your dream for health data? I would go back to Dr. Tedros's vision. He w aspired that we should be very much results driven and impact oriented and that is how WHO is transforming itself. That's how the data division and the science division has come into existence and we want to make sure that we achieve collectively the 2030 agenda of the sustainable development goals. We are only nine years away from uh, 2030 and the triple billion targets, one billion more people living healthier lives due to pu good public policies, one billion more people having access to universal health coverage without incurring financial hardship, and more than one billion and a whole world being protected from health emergencies. This is the means to move towards the sustainable development goals. And we need to count everyone. We need to count so that our actions are driven by data. Uh, and, and our aim between now and the next uh, governance summit that we will be hosting in September is to truly operationalize how we collect, store, share data and it is based on trust, it is based on networking and collaboration. So we are getting there and we will need to go there faster and together. Thank you so much, Dr. Asma, Dr. Swaminathan, thank you for, you're both very, very busy. I really do appreciate you thank spending you so some time much, with us Chris. today on this important issue. And thank you so much to our viewers who have joined us from all over the world. Um, give us a like on this video, share it to, with your friends, follow us on social media, as Dr. Asma said, you can learn more on www.who.int slash data. Yes, is correct? Oops, absolutely. Sorry, Thank you, Chris. <laughs> and uh, we hope to see you soon on another social media live from WHO. Thank you so much for joining us and have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.